Normandy, 1944. A 74-minute presentation for the Defence Electronics History Society held at the Lefroy Lecture Theatre, Shrivenham, on the 11th of May, 2006. The speaker is Professor Richard Holmes, a military historian specialising in the British Army and the two world wars. He is currently the co-director of Military and Social Studies at Cranfield University. Professor Richard Holmes. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's always a relief to discover that the few scruffy notes on the back of a packet I've got here are the right ones. And one of these days, I will get the Chinese porcelain in the reign of the Emperor Qianlong, and I will be badly embarrassed. But this afternoon, I think you're all right. I'm going to talk about Normandy, and I'm not going to do two things. Firstly, I'm not going to talk about the impact of electronics on Normandy, because you could tell me about that. It is your strong ground and not mine. And secondly, I'm not going to give an arrows on maps talk about Normandy. Some of you will have been there, and you will all have read books, seen films about the Normandy campaign. What I am going to try to do is to put what happened in Normandy 60 plus years ago into some sort of context. And I'll start really by trying to consider what I might have said about it if I was a little bit younger and I'd been giving the talk some 20 years ago. Because I think that what's happened is that there's been a real change over the way that we've interpreted Normandy in the past 20 years. If I was speaking 20 years ago, I'd have started by telling you that it was the biggest amphibious operation in history, and I'd proceed to take that risk, which no historian should actually take, of saying that it would probably always be the biggest amphibious operation in history, that we should never exceed it. 7,000 vessels, some 200,000 sailors of one sort, or another, backed by 11,500 aircraft on D-Day alone, putting 156,000 men ashore by the end of the first day and half a million ashore a week on from the operation. And that in itself is remarkable. Are we ever going to do that again? I doubt it. Actually, on D-Day, we put ashore more men than the British Army regular and territorial has in it this afternoon. And that's just the British component. And I'd have gone on about the sheer scale of it, but I won't today. Twenty years ago, I'd have said that it was one of the biggest battles in history. By its end, around a quarter of a million Germans had been killed or captured. 1,300 German tanks had been destroyed. And this at a time when German tank production had been overtaken staggeringly overtaken by Russian and American tank production. It was a battle that led directly to the liberation of Paris on the 25th of August, and then almost immediately to the liberation of Brussels. So it's a battle with enormous and immediate consequences. I have dwelt on the fact that it's a coalition operation on a huge scale. And then if you looked at the Allied forces that went ashore on D-Day, you'd have seen not simply the most obvious, the British and the American, and of course the Canadian, but we'd have added Free French and Polish and Czech and Belgian and Norwegian. And the naval historians amongst us would notice that a Norwegian destroyer was one of the only two major vessels lost in the D-Day operation. It was also one of the biggest, maybe the single biggest airborne assault in history. And I say maybe, the Russians did an airborne assault in Manchuria at the very end of the Second World War, which might have been bigger, but it is still too early to tell. But we did actually succeed in dropping three complete airborne divisions within roughly a 24-hour period. Now, that's about as many parachutists as got dropped at Arnhem, but at Arnhem, as some of you might well know to your cost, they were dropped not in a single 24-hour period, but over several days, and there, of course, lay part of the problem. It was a logistic operation on a huge scale. I often say that logisticians are the Cinderella's of warfare. They're always invited to do the grubby work, but never get to go to the ball. But, but in a sense, without an enormous logistics setup, there could have been no Normandy. And, and it's one of the things about Normandy that always strikes and surprises visitors who've never been there before the Mulberry Harbour. The British Mulberry Harbour d'Aramanche is still, to all intents and purposes, there. 
the mulberries between them consumed one quarter of the available ground tackle, that's chains and cables and anchors, available in the UK. And any one of the 60 caissons used weighed some 6,000 tons each. Now, to accomplish that, secretly, in a nation at war, and then tow two harbours across the channel, through cleared lanes, through minefields, is, I think, remarkable. And in a way, the Mulberry Harbours deserve a lecture of their own, but you're not going to get it. However, I'm not going to talk about any of that, although I think I might make a reasonable fist of it. What I'm going to try to do is to establish what we might make of Normandy now, how it fits in. Of course, the thing that we often miss about Normandy is that the context is crucial. This is one operation in the middle of a world war. And very often, people who weren't at D-Day grow slightly tetchy when we commemorate the anniversary of D-Day in particular, because there are a lot of other things going on. And what I will conclude won't, I hope, persuade you that D-Day wasn't important, because it was, but will, I hope, conclude that there could have been no D-Day without a lot of other things, and that, in a sense, the Second World War isn't, from the British and American point of view, the run-up to D-Day, D-Day, and then a long slope afterwards. Firstly, without Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain, and if I was going to go onto your home ground, I would talk about the contribution of radar to that battle, there would have been no D-Day. My last television series was on Churchill, about whom I have mixed feelings. Part of my head tells me that he was a curmudgeonly old bugger who was difficult to work with or for and was wrong as often as he was right. My heart tells me that we could not have won the war without him and that the decision that he made in 1940 to fight on was an irrational decision which probably no other contemporary major contemporary politician would have taken. Had Lord Halifax, who in a sense was the Conservative Party's choice, certainly the King's choice, to take over from Neville Chamberlain, had Halifax got the job, Halifax, I think, would have done a deal with Hitler, for which, in a sense, I don't blame him. But it was Winston, heart overhead, believing that somehow or other we could fight on against the odds, which was hugely important, because... Without the Battle of Britain and with victory in the Battle of Britain, without this unsinkable aircraft carrier separated by that moat defensive from Europe, you cannot have an invasion of Europe. How do you bring American military power to bear on the continent without Britain? How do you mount a strategic bombing campaign without Britain? So you can't really get anywhere without 1940, which I think is hugely important. The next important campaign, often forgotten, is, of course, the Battle of the Atlantic. And the Battle of the Atlantic isn't the sort of campaign which is often addressed, because there's no sudden and dramatic victory. There's not a day on which the Battle of the Atlantic is won. There isn't a moment when, all of a sudden, U-boats stop sinking Allied merchant ships and start themselves getting sunk in large numbers. It's a battle with peaks and troughs. The U-boats have two so-called happy times, essentially times when they're technology is better than the technology being used by the people attacking them, but ultimately they lose, and the price paid in the Battle of the Atlantic is substantially one paid by merchant navies. And it's always worth recalling that if you were merchant seamen in the Second World War and got sunk, as so many did, your contract of employment terminated the moment your vessel slipped beneath the waves. Uh, you were then unemployed, so you spent some time on a life raft in the North Atlantic without pay, were recovered to the United Kingdom, and then got or didn't get another vessel to sail aboard. And I do think that the Merchant Navy rarely gets the credit that it deserves for, for putting up with hard work, long hours, a high chance of being sunk, and ropey employment conditions, which nobody these days would put up with, and they're absolutely right. So... No victory on land without victory at sea. And if you happen to be British, or I would say American, that's always been true across history. An essential precursor to those American colonists 
Perth took us out of the colonies, was actually French victory off the Chesapeake Capes in the summer of 1781. It was the one time during the war that the Royal Navy's strong hand faltered when its grip faltered because de Grasse's fleet had kept a relieving force under Admiral Hood away, Yorktown surrendered. Similarly, in the Napoleonic Wars, victory at Trafalgar is the essential precursor to victory at Waterloo. Now, Waterloo is going to be some years later, but once Napoleon has lost Trafalgar, he is going to be condemned to being slowly throttled. And all his success on land, dramatic and spectacular there it is, there's going to be Austerlitz that very year, there's going to be Jena the next year, but ultimately it will avail him nothing. So, by and large, if you are a maritime power, you win at sea first, and having secured the sea, you may then hope to win on land. Historians, and I suppose the British public, are uncertain about the strategic bombing campaign against Germany. And when I say uncertain, it raises enormous moral doubts. It also raises practical doubts as to the degree to which it affected German ability to fight the war. Some would argue that German industrial production was at its height in 1944. And how can this be given the strategic bombing campaign? I think what we would have to do, if I was given to graphs, and I'm not, I would show the steady graph of German industrial production as it was, and then above it a dotted line, the graph of industrial production as it might have been had it not been for strategic bombing. We find it difficult, I think, to morally justify strategic bombing, and I don't seek to do so this afternoon. All I would say is that nations in war fight as they have to, not as they might wish to. There are two essential byproducts to strategic bombing. One of them is that the Germans fight the Normandy campaign in a situation of growing material inferiority. Now that didn't mean that if you're up against a Tiger tank it wouldn't give you a hard time, because it would. It was a very, very good piece of equipment. But it did mean that there were far fewer Tiger tanks than there might have been, because the factories that built them were being destroyed. A second crucial byproduct was that the Luftwaffe had been up by night, every night, to take on Bomber Command, by day, every day, to take on the Mighty Eighth. And in the process, the Luftwaffe had been eroded and attrited. Dreadful word, attrited, but had had attrition inflicted upon it. And therefore, that German Air Force, which one, two, three years before, certainly, might have intervened so successfully in Normandy, attacking shipping, attacking troops on beaches, simply wasn't there. Almost by a byproduct of, of the uh, strategic bombing campaign, it had been eroded. Throughout the Cold War, and I am a child of the Cold War, I grew up seeing the Russians as being hostile. I spent my military career planning to defend the railway bridge at Hesheser Ohlendorf uh, against the oncoming Red Hordes, and jolly glad I am too that I never had to do it. But during that period, we were always disinclined to see the Russian contribution in its proper context. And they, in fairness, were disinclined to see our contribution in its proper context. We tended to look at history along solid block lines. As far as we were concerned, the war had been won by the British and the Americans with a bit of help from the Russians. Names like Stalingrad came to mind. As far as the Russians were concerned, this was the great patriotic war, and the Westerners were bloody slow in starting a second front, although Comrade Stalin advised them to, and they were late simply because they were reluctant to take on the German army. The truth, of course, is far more complicated. Above all, this was a huge coalition war, and at precisely the same time that the Allies were fighting in Normandy, the German army group centre was being destroyed in Belarus. And in a sense, this idea of the Germans being simultaneously eroded from two flanks is an important one. The fact that this was a war on two major fronts meant that it was always difficult, though never impossible, for the Germans using interior lines to switch troops from one front to another. And although Allied coordination was never perfect, there were times when we have successfully attacked at almost the same time and I mentioned that I would have said that Normandy was one of the great battles of history because a quarter of a million Germans were killed or captured. I might make the point that the Battle of White Russia, Operation Bagration, 
the great offensive which the Russians mounted at the same time cost them another quarter of a million men. Now the Russians paid for these victories with something over 20 million military dead. And I think all the smart money would now say that this was a huge, this is a huge underestimate even now. It might be that if we add civilian dead, that the demographic burden of the war to Russia was something like 30, maybe more, million souls. And so in a sense, in order to understand post-war Russia, you need to understand what Russia had sacrificed and how irritating it was to generations of Russians to have that sacrifice not particularly well recognized in the West. In very general terms, I would say that if you took the two great and destructive wars of the 20th century, Germany was going to be beaten in both of them once the German army in the field had been destroyed. Now, I wish that weren't the case. I, you know, I always have much sympathy with the Basil Little Heart school of thought, which is, you know, if you can find a soft spot, go for it. I don't think the German army in both world wars provides many soft spots. And I think the First World War was essentially won by the destruction of the German army on the Western Front by the British and the French. And in the Second World War, the same role was played by the Russians on the Eastern Front. Now, it's never exclusive and wars are rarely simple. But it is worth remembering that just as you don't get Normandy without the Battle of Britain, without the Battle of the Atlantic, so too you don't get it without the Eastern Front, which has been inflicting such staggering damage on the Germans year in, year out. And of course, less prominent campaigns played their part. I was at a meeting in Portsmouth, which was helping plan the 60th anniversary celebrations for Normandy, which went quite well, actually. It was a genial civic meeting in Portsmouth, which is a good, old-fashioned town, as, fa as far as civic dignity and that sort of thing is concerned. And I rather admire it. And we were all congratulating ourselves on an evening well passed and plans well made. Then a chap stood up and said, excuse me, what is Portsmouth City Council doing to commemorate the capture of Rome? Clearly this was one of those moments when there was much, you know, there were drinks and sandwiches laid out. It had all gone rather well. I think few people in the front row had any real idea of what Rome had got to do with all this. And eventually... The answer was, not a lot is that the time we must go and have our coffee and sandwiches. But in a sense, of course, it was a very good point. Because you will know that Rome fell two days before D-Day. And Rome's fall, I mean, Rome wasn't built in a day. And of course, it didn't fall in a day. The fall of Rome was the culmination of a campaign which had actually begun the previous September with Allied landings in southern Italy and had been followed by the Allies advancing up Italy. And those of you, and again, with an audience like this, I must watch my step, you were probably there crossing the, crossing the Volturno. If you advance up Italy from the south, you discover that nature has put a mountain barrier along the centre of Italy. So if you're advancing along the east coast, you have the mountain barrier to your left, you then have ridges coming down towards the coast. Behind the ridge, there is a river. Behind the river, there is another ridge. And the Germans, inventive folk that they are, had turned these ridge and river lines into successive lines of defense. Ah, winter lines and Gustav lines and Hitler lines and Gothic lines, and so it went on. So the Allied soldiers that got to Rome two days before D-Day had, by the time they reached there, fought a very nasty campaign indeed, culminating just beforehand in the fourth and last battle of Cassino. The German corps commander at Cassino, a charming and resolute German, Anglophile and Christian, but remarkably good officer, that sort of very Germanic combination, reckoned that Cassino was worse than Verdun. Having been at both, he might know. So there you have a vicious attritional battle leading to the fall of Rome, and yet, of course, it's something we don't talk about. And I would put it to you that, that actually, D-Day would not have been the same, it might not even have been possible, had there not been that erosion, again the same word, of German strength. Depending on the time of the year and who you believe, Italy ties down between 20 and 30 German divisions. 
the deployment of even five of those would have altered the balance in Normandy to our disadvantage. And you're about to say, being full of sin and experience, how can it be then, Holmes, that, that if the Germans had deployed, would we not have done so? Ah, not in quite the same way. Because the key resource at D-Day is not actually men, it's landing craft. And so our ability to get troops to Normandy depends on landing craft, and we can only do that initial landing and then build up in a sequential order as the landing craft are ready. So had the Germans not been tied down in Italy, we might have had more troops overall, but it would have been easier probably for them to move their troops than it was for us to move ours. Lastly, let me make a point for those soldiers who found themselves as forgotten by historians as they were by British public opinion at the time, the people who were fighting in Burma. Now, I'm not going to try to persuade you that there is a direct link and causal relationship rippling all the way from Burma across the Far East and the Middle East up through the Mediterranean into Normandy, and it's never that simple. But what actually is interesting is that at precisely the same time that we have the Russians winning the Belo-Russian battle, we have the Allies taking Rome, and we have the Allies landing in Normandy, we have the great tide of the Japanese offensive, which had battered at the bastions of Kohima and Imphal, rolling back from there as well. So in a sense, what we should do is we should see Normandy in its overall context. Significant, yes, but one significant campaign in part of a long war. It's tempting, when we look back at Normandy, to take the view that it was always going to happen. That, you know, we were always going to land in Normandy, and we were always going to win. I don't think that's true at all. Read Winston's jottings the night before. Read Alan Brooks' diary the day before. And I have to say that if you ask me to name a great general from the Second World War, I'd probably put Bill Slim near the top with Monty maybe a click below. I'd put Alan Brook pretty well at the top, not because he was necessarily a brilliant field commander, although he'd done a bit of that in his youth, but because Alan Brook is that essential cartilage between Winston and the rest of the world. And if you want to sympathise with anybody, sympathise with Alan Brook, who copes with smoke-filled rooms and the rumbustious protean Winston wanting to invade Bessarabia but being quite unable to find it on the map for the moment, um, going all petulant and sulky when crossed, keeping himself refreshed with weak whiskey and water during the day and having a large cigar aboard for most of the time. I mean, the guy to feel sorry for is, is Alan Book, who puts up with this, and to whom we owe much, because it's always Alan Book, who holds up with enormous moral courage against many of Winston's follies, who stops him from doing some, but not all, of his bad ideas, and encourages them in his good ideas. And the night before, we have Alan Book, in anguish of soul, telling us in his diary how worried he is about D-Day. And we know that Winston said to Clemmy when they were retiring for bed that night, do you realise that when we wake up tomorrow morning, 20,000 of our men may have died? Now, in fact, it didn't go as badly as it might have done. But Winston was a late convert. A month before, Winston remarked, and I quote, I am beginning to warm to this operation. Beginning to warm to the operation a month before. Why? Winston is always given to being economical with the truth and wouldn't have minded my saying that, actually. Winston didn't believe in the immortality of the soul. If he's wrong and I meet him on the other side of a celestial hill, he will say, did, did I fool you? Will you take it in? Winston said, history will be kind to me. I will write it myself. <laughs> and actually, he meant it. Winston was a man who believed that you, you, know, you improved the written word to get the result that you wanted. And he feared that if Normandy went wrong on D-Day, it would be like Gallipoli. And that's not a bad comparison, is it? It was Gallipoli, after all, that had nearly cost him his political career in the First World War. If we got ashore in Normandy and didn't get pushed back across the beaches, it would be like the Somme. And that was not another bad comparison because his generation had lived through the Somme and indeed he himself had just given up commanding a battalion on the Western Front the month before the Somme began. 
So Winston was amongst the many who looked at Normandy and thought, this is going to be a difficult business. There is lots here that can go wrong, and even when we get ashore, we're going to find ourselves taking on an extremely good army on ground that it knows. Well, what made the difference? We now know, what we didn't know at the time, that Bletchley had made an extraordinary difference. Throughout the war, both sides had been eavesdropping with some success on one another's conversations. The Allies had a clear advantage because of the work done at Bletchley Park, which enabled us, for much of the war, and in most circumstances but not all, to read German strategic communications. Now, there were moments when they could do it to us, and for a particularly bad period of the war, they were able to monitor what the American military attaché in Cairo was telling Washington. And the American military attaché in Cairo was a guy with clear sight, an independent spirit, who just before the Battle of Alamein said, the Brits are in really bad condition. If Rommel wants to take the Delta, now is the time. And that's why Rommel made his, really launched the first Battle of Alamein in a desperate attempt to get to the Delta. But generally speaking, Bletchley Park generated information which enabled us to look deep into the heart of the German decision-making system. Hugely important. And really, it wasn't until Winterbottom's book on Enigma which caused such a stir that anybody knew that that had happened at all. Why? Because looking at most of you, your generation shut up about things. You know, many of you here in the audience were privy to secrets, which you kept quiet about. And you didn't immediately, the war was over, say, well, the Official Secrets Act didn't really mean what it said. I think I'll now write a book about it. So, actually, until a quarter of a century ago, people like me simply didn't know about Ultra. Huge advantage. The next great advantage that the Allies had was Operation Fortitude. And Operation Fortitude is the sort of thing that never gets much written about, not because it's secret, because it is incredibly boring. Operation Fortitude consisted of a deception plan designed to persuade the Germans that the invasion would not come in Normandy at all. As you will know, there were three main options. You can go the shortest route to the Pas de Calais from Dover, short but obvious and relatively few good beaches. You can go a slightly further distance to Normandy, more difficult with some cracking beaches, and two natural barriers on either side of the Bay of the Seine, Le Havre on one side and the Cotentin on the other. Or you can really go further, less obvious but more difficult, to Brittany. And we wanted to keep the Germans guessing. And what Operation Fortitude did, and there were two bits of it, Fortitude North and Fortitude South. Fortitude South strove to persuade the Germans that we were going for the simple option. We were actually going to land in the Pas de Calais and there would be an American army group led by George S. Patton which would do the business. So we created electronically an imitation army group. We based it in southeast England. We produced inflatable plywood, this, that, the other, tanks and guns. We even produced real American soldiers wearing spurious divisional flashes and created a whole hierarchy of fake divisions and fake corps so that the Germans were persuaded that George S. Patton was alive and well and living in Canterbury and was ready to go right across the Pas de Calais. Now, the Germans had an organisation called Foreign Armies West, and Foreign Armies West looked at all this and said, my God, my God, that these allies are, have got huge numbers. They're going to put 60 divisions ashore. Foreign Armies West duly reported this, and the German High Command said, ah, nonsense, Foreign Armies West. They haven't got that many divisions. We halve your estimate. And Foreign Armies West looked at the intelligence picture and said, we're right and they're wrong. Why don't we double our estimate? <laughs> and they will halve it, <laughs> and we will all be happy. And in fact, you know the story, and sadly it's a true story. The week they doubled the estimate, the guy who normally halved it went on leave. <laughs> so we finished up with the German high command believing the doubled estimate and believing that it was coming straight across from Kent. So when Normandy happened, there were lots of high-priced German officers saying, ah, what a subtle deception plan. A very cunning deception plan, this, but we will not be fooled. We know, 
because of the gallant activities of Foreign Army West and the noise that this man Patton is making from Canterbury, we know that this is a deception. We must keep our armoured divisions out of the Normandy battle and not move people down from Holland and Belgium because that's where the main threat will come. Now, simultaneously, Fortitude North had been trying to persuade the Germans that what we were going to do is a rerun of the 1940 campaign. Now, again, cynics in the audience might say, why would anybody want to revisit that particularly unattractive bit of military history? But the Germans kept a quarter of a million men in Scandinavia start to finish and moved none of them because of the fear that actually we might land there rather than in France. So without this deception campaign, I think there would have been a very good chance that the Germans would have done what many German commanders thought was most likely and concentrated to meet an allied threat in Normandy. And had they done so, it's always dangerous for historians to say, if they'd done this, then that. We can never be sure. But had it not been for fortitude, I think there was a good chance that we would have finished up with the Rommel solution being adopted. That is, German armour in Normandy being deployed well forward, armoured counterattacks being ready to come in at the beginning of the battle, before the Allies were properly established, and above all, before they'd got improvised airstrips from which Allied fighter bombers could take on German concentrations. So I don't think that Normandy was in any way predestined. Lastly, I think that an awful lot of Normandy had nothing to do with D-Day at all. If I spoke to the man in the street about Normandy, he would say, well, clearly, he means D-Day. But no. The Allies lose far, far more people in the fighting inland than they do on D-Day itself. It is actually as dangerous to be an infantry officer if you go from D plus one to the end of the war as it was to be an infantry officer on the Battle of the Somme. One of the striking things about the Normandy campaign is just how costly the fighting inland actually was. Depending on which part of the world we come from, but I mean, I could, could well, with a southwestern audience, talk about 43rd Wessex Division, Hill 112, 53rd Welsh Division, 15th Scottish Division, all of that incredibly bitter fighting for points in land. 43rd Wessex Division losing 2,000 killed and wounded in two days on point 112. Now that's in the context of operations that are going on now serious numbers indeed. Because once you'd got ashore, actually there was no notable technological edge in Normandy. And a lot of the fighting there, again, as some of you may know, was in little villages, in hedgerows. And the more one got up in the American area, the more it concentrated on fighting in bocage. And bocage is, is that boxy countryside of hedges often growing on banks, with little rectangular fields between them that you have to get through the hedge by going over the bank as your tank begins to do that. A Panzerfaust, the ancestor of the dreaded RPG-7, hits you in the belly, and so the process goes on. So if you talk to people who fought in Normandy, you will discover that often the thing that really lingers in their mind is not D-Day, alarming though that might be, but the fighting inland afterwards, those series of offensive battles, mm -hmm. the battles on the Odon, Epsom, Goodwood. The Battle of Goodwood, we lost more tanks than we have in any other major armoured battle that we fought. We lost more tanks at Goodwood than the British Army has got in it today. And there's a battle that slips by often unnoticed. And at the end of it, because of or almost despite Montgomery, who I admire as a commander, but admire less as a publicist. I would have more confidence in him if he occasionally admitted that things had happened despite his best intention, rather than always because of his best intention. What happens is that we do an extemporized double envelopment. We'd never planned it that way, but the British and Canadians driving down south from Caen, a great pile driver, met the Americans who'd hooked down through Avranches and eventually round, right round the far side of Falaise, close the Falaise pocket. And it is, I suppose, a reflection of an earlier point that I made, that the people who closed the pocket were, of course, the Poles. The Polish 1st Armoured Division on that piece of high ground, looking down over the killing fields of Falaise pocket. And I would almost say that no one 
but the Poles would have done it in quite the same way. This wasn't about Poles versus Germans in Normandy. For them, this was about Poland in a broader sense. This was about 1939. This is about the Duchy of Warsaw. This is about the partitions of Poland. This is about piano music and vodka in moonlit streets. This is the Poles doing it extremely well. And when the ebb and flow of battle died away, as I said, a quarter million Germans and some 1,300 tanks had disappeared. Goodness me, it is a remarkable achievement. And so there you have it. That's what I think we ought to make of Normandy now. We ought to see not a single difficult day, D-Day, much as I tug my forelock to those who were there. We ought to see even a demanding campaign with some like consequences for those in the infantry. More dangerous, more dangerous to be an armoured crewman in the Goodwood battle than to be a trooper in the light cavalry in the charge of the light brigade. We ought not even to see that. What we ought to see is a battle, a campaign that fits into a sequence, a sequence that starts way back in 1940 and goes on through the Battle of the Atlantic, through North Africa, through Italy, through Burma, and is one of many blows that brings Germany to her knees. There's a good book, now deeply out of fashion, but I do commend it to you, called Sergeant Shakespeare, written by somebody who took the view that Shakespeare must have been a soldier. And he must have been a soldier because he writes so well about military matters that in Shakespeare we do get the feel of somebody who has been woken at five in the morning to go on sentry duty. And he does give, I mean, in his wonderful description the night before Agincourt, a wonderful pre-battle sensation. Now, there is so much doubt about Shakespeare now as to whether he was Shakespeare or somebody else that I don't want to go down that particular path. But I, I'm reminded of Henry V talking to his soldiers before Agincourt, because it does seem to me to sum up all I've been talking about, when he reminds them that the battle will be fought on the feast day of those two saints, not often much remembered these days, St. Crispin and St. Cyprian. There are two of them, and they tangle the tongue. St. Crispin and St. Cyprian. And he says that the day will go on from this day till the ending of the world, and we in it shall be remembered. That's a lovely idea, isn't it? that this particular day will mean something for the rest of history. And in a strange way, that's true of D-Day, is it not? The day will go on until the end of the world, and we in it shall be remembered. So remember D-Day. Remember it as an anniversary. Remember it as an Agincourt moment. Remember it with Laurence Olivier, as you will have seen him, playing King Harry. But don't just remember that. Remember all those other occasions. Remember our crew getting into aeroplanes on South of England aerodromes on misty, damp mornings in September 1940. Remember everything else that happened. And remember how, as I hope I have now persuaded you, Normandy is not an event in itself. It is a culmination. Thank you. Professor Holmes was asked the following 11 questions. Question 1. Was the intervention of Strategic Air Force in the Battle of Normandy a misuse of resources? The intervention of Strategic Air Force in Normandy, was it a misuse or otherwise? There were two aspects to the problem. And just so that we're all on the same piece of ground, Strategic Air Forces are heavy bombers, typically flying fortresses for the Americans or Lancasters for the, for the Brits, designed to bomb deep into enemy territory. And they get used as part of the Normandy campaign in two ways. Firstly, they were taken off German tasks and put into what we would now call interdiction tasks, trying to hit particularly rail junctions and marshalling yards in the run-up to Normandy to try to paralyse German strategic communications. This was done against the forcefully expressed opinion of Air Marshal Arthur Harris, the Air Officer Commanding in Chief Bomber Commander, who thought that it was a waste of his resources, and towards the end of his long life, he expressed the view very forcibly to me. As far as he was concerned, strategic bombers were strategic, they produced a strategic effect, and the whole of the Normandy campaign was a waste of rations, which was diverting resources, which ought to have been converted into bombs and dropped on Germany. In fact, Bomber Command did a much better job 
in interdiction on Germany than many might have expected. I think it did better than Arthur Harris would have expected of it. It's one of the reasons why it took a German division about five days to get from the Eastern Front to the Rhine and then two weeks to get from the Rhine to Normandy. So without the application of strategic bombers to a tactical task, I would argue that normally would have been more difficult. And probably most of the ticks would be in the approving box for that. More controversially, there were two occasions when strategic bombers got used on a large scale for battlefield tasks. One of them was for, on the British side of Normandy, for Operation Goodwood. The other was on the American side of Normandy for Operation Cobra. And they were both used in the same way to create a carpet of bombs across a German defensive position through which first British and latterly American armour would roll. Now, there were problems. There were problems, first of all, with coordination. In the case of the American strategic bombers, they bombed a day early. They also bombed only slightly in the wrong place. And I say only slightly in the wrong place. There'd been a long and nugatory discussion as to whether the bombers were going to bomb on the far side of the Perrier saint lo road, flying this way, or whether the bombers were going to fly over the Perrier saint lo road and start bombing once they had crossed it. In fact, they went for the second option. And those of you who know something about this, know many who do, will know what happened. Of course, the bomb line moved back this way as successive bombers bombed short because their target was obscured. In effect, a lot of bombs fell on Americans and the most senior American officer killed in the whole of the Second World War, Lieutenant General Leslie J. McNair, was killed by American bombs. This created a problem because they had just moved Patton to Europe and had moved McNair, in theory, to Canterbury to take over from Patton in the notional army group Patton, so they had to keep quiet about McNair's death. The next difficulty was that the bombs didn't really do what was expected of them, and the subsequent difficulty was that they had, no prizes for guessing this, an extraordinary effect upon the ground. And so many tank units found their way blocked, not by German resistance, but by Allied bombing. It took so long to move through the destroyed area that in the process, the surviving defenders had largely recovered by the time that Allied ground forces caught up with them. My objection to it isn't that it was a bad idea. I think we were so desperate to get a breakthrough in Normandy that it was probably a necessary idea. But it was cobbled together across several chains of command. And this is the real problem. If we read Omar Bradley, and Omar Bradley by this stage was commanding the American army group on the western side of Normandy, in order to make the Cobra bombing happen, Bradley had to fly back to a conference in England, but because he'd got an army group to command, he couldn't stay to the end of the conference. But he needed, as a four-star officer, to be at the conference and then go back to command his army group. These days, I am sure, we would have ways of communicating laterally so that there would be somebody on the ground saying what might happen. Those mechanisms were not in place at the time, and so the bombing didn't achieve the result that it might have done and left a legacy of bitterness. So an awful lot of Americans in particular thereafter were resentful about American strategic bombers who they thought had bombed them and who were going back to large breakfasts and comfortable beds. An awful lot of American strategic bombers, and Bomber Command too for that matter, felt resentful about being put in an environment where there was a lot of low-level air defence and where you were doing an extremely difficult task for which you were not ideally suited. So, not a bad idea, but an idea which left a lot to be desired in practice. And ultimately, if you go back to Normandy now, the generation of most of you will meet Frenchmen of your age who will say, it was war, we were occupied, few things are worse than occupation, I know why you did it. My daughter's generation in France don't think that at all. And they say, why did you use bombers this big? Why did you level Caen? Why did you level Saint-Lô? Why did you destroy these wonders of Norman architecture? And if you say, ah, but the Germans are occupying them, and they say, well, the Germans occupied them after you'd bombed them too. So I am slightly sceptical, if you'll forgive me. I think it was a good idea, 
but the execution was slightly wrong. Question two. Was it from Ultra that we first knew the Calais date had been swallowed? Yes, it was from Ultra that we had a, a really very good idea of what the German deployment in Normandy was. And we kept Fortitude going until August. Now, it's not until the 9th of August that the Germans have at last got the message, beyond all doubt, that it's Normandy and not Calais. And that's really quite some time on. The outcome for the head of Foreign Armies West is not a happy one. He was, in fact, shot by firing squad for fiddling the figures. But what Ultra does is enables us to know, never perfectly, exactly what the Germans are doing, and to recognize that it was worth mounting expensive diversion operations. Now, this includes doing things like flying squadrons of, like your point, so heavy bombers across the channel, dropping window to confuse German radar. The Russians called this sort of thing Maskirovka. And a Russian would tell you that you cannot have a deception plan which doesn't consume resources. That, you know, having thousands of imitation tanks, having lots of fake Americans, dropping window in the channel consumes resources. And what Ultra did was, if you like, it gave us some evidence that there was a payoff for the resources. In other words, the Germans weren't, as we feared they might, moving armour into the area until it was too late. Question three. A survivor from the action at Falaise recall that the 53rd Division went in from the British side and the Canadians from the other side, and there was no hole visible, and that after the battle they had the unpleasant task of having to shoot the German horses injured in the fighting. Professor Holmes was asked to comment. A couple of points. What you'd have done is you'd have come along the main thrust that came in on or parallel with the road from Caen to Falaise, following operations totalise and tractable. What the Poles did is they then hooked off in a westerly direction. So if you think of yourself going down that long straight road to Falaise, the Poles had moved off in that direction. Therefore, they'd have been in the Falaise pocket, but about five miles further west of where you hit it. The second thing is that a German infantry division in Normandy in 1944 had two and a half to 3,000 horses in it. What the Germans had done is they'd modernized their army in a selective way. Their panzer divisions were very good, but in a sense, their infantry divisions were the same as First World War German infantry. In other words, they had an awful lot of old-fashioned equipment. And one of the things, and there'll probably be someone in the audience, one of the things that upsets typhoon pilots in Normandy most was shooting German horses. And that in a strange way, many people coped with killing other people because that was their job and that was war. But they found the damage done to German horses in the Falaise pocket more deeply shocking because in a sense it wasn't horses war. And if you were a countryman, and a lot of British infantry were countrymen, there was something shocking to seeing unmilked cows and horses who'd been crippled. And I have to say, your description of the Falaise pocket is a classic, because most people who've talked to me about it have said, this was like the Dorset I grew up in. You know, this was a proper rural landscape with orchards and cattle and good heavy set Norman horses. And to see it smashed up from there and by artillery went straight to my heart. That's what a lot of people would say. Question four. How big a part do you feel the Merchant Navy played in preventing this country from being occupied? The role of the Merchant Navy in both world wars is fundamental. Winston said, and for once I believe him, that the only thing that really worried him in two world wars was actually the U-boat menace. And I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I felt that there were probably moments when other things worried him a bit you know, like the Luftwaffe and Panzer divisions. But, but actually, the upside of being an island with a moat defensive and enjoying wonderful sea power is that, as Francis Bacon put it in the reign of the first Elizabeth, you can take as much or as little of the war as you like. You can avoid big continental battles if it suits you. You can send expeditionary forces. But you can do so only so long as you can sustain 
your base and your population. And that is a task carried out by the Merchant Navy. Carried out by the Merchant Navy with few medals and little recognition, not just in the Second World War, but in the First World War too. One of the many things I cram into my funny old life is being a trustee of the Royal Armouries. And on my way from the Royal Armouries offices in the Tower of London to Tower Hill Station, I always deviate past the Merchant Navy Memorial there on Tower Hill and remember that these are the guys day in, day out, grey days in the North Atlantic, sweltering days in the tropics that keep the national base supported. Without them, there can be no victory. Question 5. If the Germans had used their retaliation weapons, the V1 and V2 rockets, earlier than 1944, do you think this would have affected the choice of date for the invasion because of their effect on civilian morale? It's about the, the V weapons, V1 and V2. And there's a wonderful cartoon, it's a Daily Mail cartoon, showing a London housewife in the wreckage of her home. And someone says, where's your husband then, missus? And she says, he's in Normandy, the coward. Um, <laughs> I mean, those of you who live through it will not need reminding by me, but that there was a feeling that actually the Luftwaffe's back had been broken and that the great air attacks of 40-41 had stopped and there might be the occasional patch of bad luck, but what happened in 44 was an ugly surprise and did have an effect on civilian morale because partly we'd expected that it wouldn't happen again. Now, had the Germans been able to target them more accurately, been able to hit the Mulberry Harbours, been able to hit the beaches, the story might have been different. But given that they were never going to be terribly accurate and that they were tipped with conventional explosive, their effect was going to be tactical and irritating rather than what Hitler hoped, which was strategic and decisive. Now remember that what I've tried to do is to give you a picture of the complexity and the granularity of the war. If we change that slightly and saw German research at Pienemunde going in different directions and saw the Germans being successful with heavy water or prepared to take a risk with biological weapons, then that story might have been different. But as it happens, mercifully, it wasn't. But of course, it did influence Normandy because it made Montgomery's life more difficult because no sooner was he in Normandy than he was then under pressure from Winston, sometimes restrained by Allen Book and sometimes not, saying, get on, get on and take the bases from which these things are being launched. In other words, we're never going to have a total answer to them in technological terms, although, as you will know, we developed some answers. What you've actually got to do is to get on through Normandy quickly and to take the bases from which V-weapons are being launched. And in particular, to prevent them from coming to full fruition. And if you haven't been to that very well-developed German weapons base near Saint-Omer in northern France, I do commend it to you. It's called La Coupole, and it is most instructive and gives you an insight into the way that the Germans were developing their V-weapons. Question six. Can you comment on how and why German intelligence failed to identify where we were going to land on D-Day? Yeah, OK. You would all imagine that everything German is single-minded and remorselessly efficient. In fact, the, the Third Reich was run like a strangely feudal state. One of the things that Hitler liked to do was to keep everybody divided. So we could have old Hermann Goering running part of the empire and dressing up a lot. No reflection on you, sir. <laughs> Although... It is a very smart bow tie. Um, and you could have Heinrich Himmler running something completely different, and you could have the army doing something else. Never, ever give one agency the responsibility for everything. Because if you did that, they might well build up such a power base that it would disadvantage you. The disadvantage with this is that German intelligence is never centrally coordinated. And when it comes close to being... Its head, Admiral Canaris, probably sympathises with the Allies. 
He sympathised with the Allies enough to be hanged in a concentration camp towards the war's end. So we have an intelligence system which is never terribly good, some of whose leaders sympathised with the resistance against Hitler, and which never really got its act together. Now, the last thing I would do is try to say that there's always a lesson in history. I would say, though, that intelligence organisations which are not overarching are likely to leave gaps between themselves and the next agency. And through those gaps, problems will come. That, I fear, will be the lesson of the reports out today into the London bombings of last year. And without going into too much detail, some of the mistakes the Germans made were staggering. You know, a German agent dropped by submarine on the south coast of England immediately goes into a post office and demands a pint of beer. Um, <laughs> he was arrested within minutes, taken off to London, interrogated, and given a choice. He could, as a loyal German, get hanged, or he could send the reports that we wanted him to send. Hey, you know, most German agents got turned, and most of them made staggeringly basic mistakes by simply speaking good English, but not understanding cultural points. You know, you turn up in the middle of Wiltshire and say, which way to the coal mine? <laughs> you know, and you don't last long. And Britain during the Second World War was very hard to penetrate. I mean, this was a society without a substantial pro-German population. There are not lots of safe houses. You can't arrive in London under pressure, and know that if you go to number 15 Mayfair and knock three times, Mrs. McGuinness will answer the door and give you a safe house. It's not like that at all. Whereas Allied agents in France, difficult and dangerous though it was, had a much better chance of finding sympathetic locals. And there were an awful lot of French emigres in England who, I mean, I was reading out the other day of Violette Zabo, who on her last mission wore some proper French earrings back to France. But it was little things like that. You know, the German agent arrives wearing a smart suit with the cufflinks. The interrogators start work and say, it's very good to see you, Mr. Jones. We're particularly fascinated by the Berlin hallmark on your cufflinks. <laughs> Question seven. The British gave the Americans access to Bermuda in exchange for 50 of their destroyers. How significant were they in winning the Battle of the Atlantic? OK, this is about the 50 really old American destroyers which come to Britain very early on in the war. There are really two issues. The first is the bigger issue. And I would argue that one of the things that we ought to give Churchill credit for, and again, there are lots of things that I don't agree, remember, but Winston is the guy who forges the Grand Alliance. Winston's mum was American. Just before his 21st birthday, he went to New York and stayed with a chap that we might most kindly call a very close friend of hers, who had a wonderful brownstone mansion overlooking Central Park. Winston liked America. He felt that America was like Britain, but wasn't, as he put it, and I'm safe today, strangled by old school ties. When he, he addressed a joint session of Congress in 1942, he said, and I believe him, had things been slightly different, I might have got here on my own account. So here you have a man who likes America, and who quickly established a good relationship with Roosevelt. And Roosevelt went as far towards helping us as he constitutionally could. And you would say, well, Roosevelt didn't give us anything. He got something back in exchange. And that's perfectly true. But given the fact that the Americans only just introduced the draft by one vote, I mean, here is a country terrified of involvement in a world war, I think Winston did bloody well to get anything out of them at all. And it meant, of course, the minute that the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, all is much improved. So 50 old destroyers are the symbol of something. They don't necessarily turn the Battle of the Atlantic just like that. In practice, what happens, the Battle of the Atlantic, and with merchant skippers in the room, I need to watch my step. The Battle of the Atlantic is eventually won by a series of measures which are tactical and technical. The tactical measures involve keeping merchant ships together in convoy, which actually made it more difficult for the Germans to find them and ensured some defence. And the technical measures 
eventually meant that warships and aircraft, and remember that all the time this is going on, we are extending the air bridge across the North Atlantic until that wonderful moment it meets in the middle. Once that's happened, the U-boats are always going to lose. Now, 50 old big smokestack destroyers aren't ever going to do that. But what they are going to do early on is to persuade us that the Americans are going to give us kit. And in those early difficult days, we're going to give us a little bit of tactical muscle and mean that we don't lose badly early. It's often easy to be cynical, you see. And if I was young and brash, I would say, ah, oh, these are old technology. These are not the things that win the Battle of the Atlantic. The Battle of the Atlantic goes on for a long time only because we don't lose it first off. And if you lose it quickly and easily, which God knows we nearly did, then you can go no further. So they are important, not decisive, but important. Question eight. Why did the Americans turn down the British offer of Hobart's Follies, apart from the ordinary floating tank, when the crocodile and flail tank might have transformed the landings at Omaha dramatically? Hobart's Funnies are the specialised armoured vehicles which were concentrated in 79th Armoured Division, produced under the auspices of Percy Hobart, out of the army in 1940, Lance Corporal in the Home Guard, brought back in Montgomery's brother-in-law, interestingly, who presided over this collection of odd vehicles. And we had become very keen on them, in part because the lessons of Dieppe suggested that the problems of getting off a beach were significant, that you'd have a stone sea wall to breach, and so you needed the ability to project a very big explosive charge a short distance against that. You needed to clear mines, Using flamethrowers against pillboxes, ghastly though it seems on a sunny afternoon, was one way of dealing with them. And we became very keen on them. And the Americans decided that, as you said, with the exception of duplex drive Sherman tanks, they were not going to use these. And they thought that for a variety of reasons. Now, this is a contentious issue. A recent book on Omaha suggests that the Americans were misled by the Brits into attacking at the wrong time on D-Day. And what the Americans should have done is maximised firepower throughout the morning of D-Day by both air and sea, and then landed in the afternoon. But they went along with the Brit approach, which was to concentrate under cover of darkness, and then to land on a rising tide just after first light. In other words, the most recent American book on Omaha says... We got Omaha Beach because we'd gone along with our coalition partner's plan, which suited him but not us. I happen to believe that's wrong, but it highlights a natural, national preference for war. And the author says, you know, we got the real estate, we got the resources. What we should have done is simply flatten the beach defences by daylight, which we were configured to do. What in fact we did is landed an hour earlier than the Brits, because remember the way the tide goes up the Normandy coast means in essence that the Omaha and Utah landings were an hour before those at Gold, Juno and Sword. And in consequence, we had a whole hour of daylight less than the Brits for the preliminary bombardment. And an awful lot of the damage done by the Brits to targets on the ground was done in that last hour was done by accurate last-minute bombardment, um, either by bombardment groups or by destroyers running close in shore to take on point targets. Given that context, we can understand why, in a sense, the Americans didn't go for the funnies. It's now clear that Omaha would probably have been very different indeed had they had the funnies, and maybe they were sort of caught in a doctrinal vice, that on the one hand, they didn't go for their first preference, which is going in heavy, straight up the middle, in daylight with firepower, which might have worked. On the other, they didn't go for the Brit approach either, which is going in first light, but technologically very heavy. Remember that the first people who hit the ground on D-Day, and watch my step here, on most beaches are not the infantry, but sappers. And the Americans, are, in a way, come in along the middle. They haven't got enough time for heavy bombardment, but they haven't got the funnies. 
There was also, and I want to say, with an American naval officer in the audience, I say this gently, because we want to avoid national stereotyping. There was a kind of feeling that the Brits were old and tired. That we had been at it since 1939. We were nothing like as enthusiastic about Normandy as the Americans. You know, the Americans had always been clear. Build up in Britain, invade France, advance on Berlin, quick as you like. And the Brits were always saying, well, that's quite good, but we think that Italy is quite a good idea. What about invading Sicily? Hey, the Mediterranean looks good for us. We're really worried about the Suez Canal. And there is a sort of view, and you discover this in the correspondence between Eisenhower and, and George C. Marshall, the Allenbrook equivalent, if you like, that the Brits are cautious, and they're cautious because they've been shot at too much. They've done it throughout the war. They lost a million men killed in the First World War. And there's no particular virtue in having lots of people killed. But if you look at the impact of the First World War on Britain, a million dead, that's not casualties, it's dead for Britain and her empire. We were cautious. We tended to look for devices which let metal and not flesh do the business. This is a younger America, a pre-Vietnam America, that looks at that and says, hey, we don't do things that way. So, of course, they'd have made a difference. But it's awfully easy to say, that's because the Americans are stupid. They're not. They're different. They were different then, and they're different now. Question 9. It was suggested that the use of Obo to knock out coastal batteries before the actual landing was very effective, and was a classic example of the contest between the technological use of precision armament rather than a mass attack. Professor Holmes was asked to comment. Obo gets used to produce something close to precision bombing of German batteries. Interestingly, we now know, and I take my students on the Haar Command and Staff course to the Chaos Battery at Long sur mer where we actually spend a lot of time looking at what made the various holes. Here you've got a German six-gun battery which has been hit by everything and eventually taken by infantry assault. Because what had happened is that the aerial bombardment had destroyed two of the six guns and it hit the battery in general very liberally. But at that stage in proceedings, what Oboe would do is it would put a hundred bombs into the area between here and the front gate. But it didn't give you the absolutely precision, absolute precision, that you would now get from a laser-guided bomb. The next thing that we had was HMS Ajax unwisely engaged by the same battery, which put one round straight through the firing slot with depressing consequences for those inside and as a result of that the remaining gunners decided that a hand of cards for the rest of the morning was probably a wise move <laughs> and in fact the battery was eventually taken by two companies of infantry the following day the lesson then appeared to be that what oboe and precision air power would give you was a good probability of killing what you were after but no certainty so if you really, really wanted to be sure of something, there was no alternative but to getting people on the ground, which is why ultimately the Americans sent rangers to take the battery at the Point du Hoc, which had been bombed and shelled, but ultimately what you had to do was to smack a ranger battalion, and you'll remember it in the film The Longest Day. These are the guys that go right up the side of those cliffs, commanded by one of those chaps who democratic armies produce, a guy called James Earl Rudder, who was a high school teacher and football coach before the war, and turned into a very, very good commando officer. And they went up the front of the cliff and took the place, which was as well because the Germans had moved the guns, and so none of the other things would have done the same sort of job. Probably, technology has now changed this equation. And there are now circumstances where you could rely upon technology absolutely doing the job for you, but you couldn't in the Second World War. However good it was, ultimately, you needed some muscular individual with a size 10 boot to stand upon the objective. Question 10. The V1 and V2 were frightening weapons. Did the V2 have a significantly greater effect? They have two sorts of significant effect. The first is that they are large casualty producers. They were, by the standards of the age, contained more explosives than a lot of the bombs which the Germans had dropped in the Blitz proper. They arrived by both day and night. 
they burst quite flat. So their destructive potential in streets of houses was substantial. And psychologically, they arrived at a time when we thought we were winning. And if you think you've put bombing behind you, and suddenly you get V1s and V2s, it is a shock. So the morale effect was significant. I think the jury is out on what people found most frightening. Some people would say it was the sudden arrival, a huge thump without any warning at all in broad daylight. Others would say it was the sound of an engine, which you would sort of listen, and you would think, the engine's still going, the engine's still going, oh, blast, it's stopped. But, but ultimately, almost all of these weapons rely for their effect upon their psychology. The surprising thing is how many people in resolute societies you can kill without demoralizing the society in question. And that unless you are prepared to be frightful beyond belief and have the ability to do so, bombing civilian populations to change the way they think is not usually a good idea. It upsets them, it makes them capricious, it depresses them. It might, interestingly, make them more extreme. In Churchill's case, it drove him into directing the chiefs of staff to look very hard at the use of poison gas. And he produced a minute out of desperation, really. And nothing, I'm happy to say, came of it. But Winston's psychology, and here we have a man who was 65 when he came to power, for goodness sake, I mean, by this stage, Winston is old and tired and sick. And the last thing he wants is for the Germans to develop weapons like this and to imperil what he sees as victory. And we see him drafting a minute at the very end of 1944, saying, I direct you, chiefs of staff, to look at the effect we might get of scattering poison gas on Germany. And I'm, you know, I'm sick of what's being done to me. Now, typically, it was diffused and nothing happened. But it has an effect, not least on Winston, who was a man who coped remarkably well with physical danger. And there was a man who, in his early life, came within measurable distance of winning a VC twice. But I think that his psychology by that stage in the war was weak. And so usually, the impact of weapons, whether they're dropped from the air or set off on tube trains, is psychological, not physical. It changes the way that people think. It might make them want to capitulate. It might make them more obdurate. You cannot predict which in advance. Question 11. Would you agree that the effect of fire raids is far more frightening than conventional bombing? Even London, which was bombed less savagely, I mean, just look at the few remaining Wren churches from a lofty eminence and look at what fire did to townscapes. And in a sense, we were lucky. And, and in a way, we were talking about psychology, and I must say this and then shut up. There is something about destroying cities by fire which goes to the heart of the human psyche that if you read what people like the Assyrians did and the Hittites, if you read chaps like Assyr Bani Pal II, king of Assyria, because he always had, you know, masons recording accounts, and it was always, you know, I took the city, I burnt it down, I destroyed the temples, I flattened everything, I made it like it had never been. And I think there is something in our psyche that regards the destruction of a great city in that sort of way as going straight to the pit of our stomach. I think there is something, there's something frightening about big fires in any event, and something profoundly shocking, and I think profoundly distasteful to the whole human condition, in a sense, even if it's the enemy that's having it done to them. So yes, depressing note to finish on, but you're very right. Professor Richard Holmes can be contacted by email at e.r.holmes, that's H-O-L-M-E-S, at cranfield.ac.uk.